Hello, my sweet summer children. I'm back with the juice to get you through the long night. Today, I'm going to be diving deep into the old gods in the weirwood trees, but not only that, we will be taking a look at the weirwood tree at Harrenhal, at Daemon Targaryen, and the possibility that the children of the forest may appear in House of the Dragon. Before I get started, I'm going to ask you one question. Have you ever wondered who was the green seer before Bloodraven? Who preceded Bloodraven? Mm, let's talk about it. This is a big video. Get your fucking popcorn, cause I got the juice. At the center of the grove, an ancient weirwood brooded over a small pool where the waters were black and cold. The heart tree, Ned called it. The weirwood bark was white as bone, its leaves dark red like a thousand bloodstained hands. A face had been carved in the trunk of the great tree, its features long and melancholy. The deep cut eyes red with dried sap and strangely watchful. They were old eyes, older than Winterfell itself. We are first introduced to the weirwoods very early in A Game of Thrones, actually in Catelyn's first chapter of A Game of Thrones. Catelyn is actually afraid of these trees. It's like she feels the eyes of the trees watching her. It's an uneasy feeling almost. She doesn't really like them. Maybe they don't like her. But Catelyn also gives us a bit of information that isn't correct. She says, in the south, the last weirwoods have been cut down and burned out thousands of years ago, except on the Isle of Faces. We know that that is, in fact, not the truth of it. There are still weirwoods all over Westeros, and there is one in Harrenhal. There are weirwoods in the south, and not just on the Isle of Faces. The deeper we get into A Song of Ice and Fire and the history and lore, a bigger picture starts to emerge when it comes to weirwood trees. So let's dive in. Throughout real world mythology, trees play a significant role in many religions. Trees represent many different things, life cycles, birth, growth, death, and rebirth. The tree of life appears in the Garden of Eden, the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In folklore, trees are often said to be homes of tree spirits, and it's said that it was common for Germans to worship trees in sacred groves. Celtic Druids would worship in sacred groves and have religious ceremonies, including human sacrifices. It's no secret that George is a huge history buff, and almost everything in this story is influenced by real world events and folklore and myth with his own magic punched into it. That's why it feels like a living, breathing story, and we love it so much. But George treats his world the same way. A lot of times, something that's going on in the present actually matches the history of the world. So in the north, every castle has its godswood, and every godswood has a heart tree. But as we venture further beyond the north and deeper into the unknown, heart trees are everywhere. Massive heart trees, like the one in White Tree Village, the one with its mouth full of bones. So by the time that Bran gets to Blood Raven's cave in the north, I think it's safe to say that Blood Raven's cave is in fact the scariest of all of the weirwoods. Like, it's, it's creepy. But this weirwood cave gives us a lot of insight into the children of the forest and into the weirwoods themselves. And we can start to make connections to earlier things that might lead to answers. So let's talk about it. So we learned that beneath the heart tree is a cave, Blood Raven's cave. But this isn't the first time we have seen a cave system under a weirwood in Westeros. So the first time we see it is in Winterfell. The Crypts of Winterfell. If you've been listening to my theories for like the last four years, then you know I believe the Crypts of Winterfell were actually an ancient cave of the Children of the Forest. We are told of the existence of something called Secret Tree Towns. And the children of the forest used to inhabit secret tree towns. We hear of the secret tree towns first from Bran very, very early in A Game of Thrones. They were a people, dark and beautiful, small of stature, no taller than children, even when grown to manhood. They lived in the depths of the wood, in caves and crannogs, in secret tree towns. That's the first time we hear of it. And it's like, damn, what the fuck is a secret tree town? Okay, a town that's under the trees that's secret okay okay but the idea of secret tree towns is also doubled down on in the world book by a maester and old nan also tells us of wooden cities and hollow hills yet here and there in the fastness of the woods the children still lived in their wooden cities and hollow hills and the faces in the trees kept watch 
Okay, Blood Raven calls his cave, or Blood Raven's cave, is also called a hollow hill. The caves were timeless, vast, silent. They were home to more than three score living singers and the bones of thousands dead and extended far below the hollow hill. Men should not go wandering in this place, Leaf warned them. The river you hear is swift and black and flows down and down to a sunless sea. And there are passages that go even deeper, bottomless pits and sudden shafts, forgotten ways that led to the very center of the earth. Even my people have not explored them all, and we have lived here for a thousand thousand of your man years. Okay, so we have the idea of secret tree towns and these tunnels and these caves. So Winterfell is built on top of a secret tree town. And that is the reason that the ground at Winterfell was never leveled. The Starks putting their dead beneath the roots of the weirwood trees also makes sense when you take a look at Blood Raven's cave and all the bones and the children encased in roots. Likely all of these tunnels and caves are connected. So Bran describes Blood Raven's cave as timeless and there are parts of the crypts that have never been explored that are partially collapsed. There is also another thing about Blood Raven's cave that it has in common with the crypts of Winterfell. Remember the black pool at Winterfell? Well, the cave has a sunless sea. So if one of these weirwood cities is the crypts of Winterfell and one is Blood Raven's cave, then it's highly likely, almost surely, that there are more of these kind of caves. We even see it in the preview chapter of Winds of Winter in the Rainwood, that cave that Arianne stumbles into. And I think there may be a secret tree town at Harrenhal. Put your fucking tinfoil hats on and let's go for a ride. Now that we have established weirwood cities and secret tree towns and tunnels, let's talk about Harrenhal, the God's Eye, and Daemon Targaryen. So let's lay out some terrain so it's easy to follow. Harrenhal is a huge fortress on the banks of the God's Eye. In the middle of the God's Eye is the Isle of Faces. The Isle of Faces is the most sacred isle to the children of the forest. It has an ancient grove of weirwood, and this is where the first men and the children forged the pact. So the heart tree at Harrenhal is so out of place, right? Let me tell you why. One of the most haunted and cursed places in Westeros is Harrenhal. In the Riverlands, on the banks of the God's Eye, Black Heron built a fortress. Heron devoted 40 years to building the massive castle. It was the largest castle ever raised in Westeros. It had five gargantuan towers, huge subterranean vaults, massive walls of black stone. Harrenhal has the largest rooms in all the castles in all the Seven Kingdoms. This is why when like all the great lords gather to play their Game of Thrones, it's usually at Harrenhal, like the tourney of Harrenhal. Harrenhal, but also the Great Council of 101. Harrenhal is actually three times larger than Winterfell. The Great Hall at Harrenhal is called the Hall of a Hundred Hearths because it has, get this, 130 something fireplaces and it's said to be able to host an army. Harrenhal is just beyond scale massive, even in its current state of ruin. We see it still like a formidable fortress, but just as big and massive as Harrenhal is, it has just as many secrets. Harrenhal is cursed. After 40 years of building this massive castle for his family to live in, his house to grow in, on the day of its completion, Aegon the Conqueror burned Harren and his family alive inside the castle and ended house whore for good. Anyone who has held Harrenhal has met their demise. It's like passed from person to person and said person has had some calamity or another happen to them. That's why Littlefinger is likely doomed. Like if someone tried to give me Harrenhal, I would just assume like they don't really fuck with me like that. But anyway, when Black Heron was building Harrenhal, there is a quote about just how gruesome building Harrenhal was. 40 years it had taken rising like a great shadow on the shore of the lake while Heron's armies plundered his neighbors for stone, lumber, gold, and workers. Thousands of captives died in his quarries, chained to his sledges, or laboring on his five colossal towers. Men froze by winter and sweltered in the summer. 
Weirwoods that had stood 3,000 years were cut down for beams and rafters. Heron had beggared the Riverlands and the Iron Islands alike to ornament his dream. And when at last Heron Hall stood complete, on the very day King Heron took up residence, Aegon the Conqueror had come ashore at King's Landing. So there's a couple red flags here, two of them actually. So let's talk about it. So the reason I say that this weirwood is out of place is one, Heron didn't keep the old gods, so why keep this weirwood? But also because Catelyn says that Heron buggered the whole Riverlands for weirwood, but overlooked the one right in his yard. Also, we have slaves dying in his quarries, sweating to death and freezing to death while laboring on his castle. This is also very, very reminiscent of the Valyrian mines. It is said that in the Valyrian mines, the slaves that would die um, were feeding the Valyrian magic, fire and blood. So what the fuck is going on at Harrenhal? Was Black Heron like consorting with the Children of the Forest? Keep in mind the HQ of the Children of the Forest is in his backyard. Literally, the Isle of Faces is in his backyard. So we have these stories during the Age of Heroes of men consorting with the Children of the Forest to build massive structures uh, or Brand the Builder being this person that consorted with the Children of the Forest, like the Wall, the High Tower of Old Town, Winterfell, and Storm's End, all of which had this magical protection. Maybe it was that Heron the Black was consorting with the Children of the Forest while building Heron Hall, and they might have stopped helping him once he started using Weirwood to make his rafters or something. Or they might have tricked him. It could be their magic that made Heron so sure that Aegon couldn't do shit to him, even with a dragon. Or maybe it's not that deep, but I did want to point that out. But anyway, during the Dance of Dragons, one of the biggest events that happens at Heron Hall is the Dragon vs. Dragon, Daemon vs. Aemon battle above the God's Eye. Again, this weirwood, this weirwood at Heron Hall, front and center. Damon uses Dark Sister to put slashes in the tree to mark the days. 13 slashes. The slashes are so deep that they still to this day bleed every spring. Dark Sister is Valyrian steel, so I'm wondering like if the initial faces that still bleed, that like have the crying sap, if they were carved with Valyrian steel. That's like a Valyrian steel, dragon steel connection. We'll do another video on that because we can't even spin off into that whole thing. We got to focus. The interesting thing about the battle above the God's Eye is they find both dragon corpses, they find Aemon One-Eye still chained to Vagar with Dark Sister sticking out of his head, but they never find Damon's body. So let's talk about it. Where could Damon have went? Could he have survived? I have some thoughts. And to get to these thoughts, we're going to have to talk about Nettles, the dragon rider of Sheep Stealer. I definitely think that Damon was in love with her and she was in love with him. And I think that because of the way they departed. So when they depart, it says, how the prince and his bastard girl spent their last night beneath Lord Mooton's roof is not recorded. But as dawn broke, they appeared together in the yard and Prince Damon helped Nettle saddle Sheep Stealer one last time. It was her custom to feed him each day before she flew. Dragons been easier to their rider's will when full. That morning, she fed him a black ram, the largest in all Maidenpool, slitting the ram's throat herself. Her riding leathers were stained with blood when she mounted her dragon. Maester Norn records, and her cheeks were stained with tears. No word of farewell was spoken betwixt man and maid, but as Sheep Stealer beat his leathery brown wings and climbed into the dawn sky, Caraxes raised his head and gave a scream that shattered every window in John Quill's tower. High above the town, Nettles turned her dragon toward the Bay of Crabs and vanished in the morning mist, never to be seen again at castle or court. There is a theory in the fandom that Nettles is actually a leaf. A lot of people hate this theory, but I looked into it and I feel there is a lot of evidence for it. And we are going to talk about it. And if you want all of the juice about Nettles, you can watch my full video about Nettles. I'll link it below. But for this video, I want to stick to the basics because it's already long as hell. So we know from brand two of A Dance with Dragon that Leaf tells Bran, I was born in the time of the dragon. And for 200 years, I walked the world of men to watch and listen and learn. 
I might be walking still, but my legs were sore and my heart was weary, so I turned my feet for home. Two things jump right out. She would have been walking the human world during the time of the dance. And two, she had a mission to look, to learn, to observe. You know, like some Arya faceless man type shit. And the children of the forest, they can see through the eyes of the weirwoods. At least the green seers can. So would she really need to walk the world of men? She would, because you know where there are no weirwoods? There are no weirwoods at Driftmark. King's Landing, nor Dragonstone. So if you wanted to spy on those particular places, you might have to actually go mingle amongst the people and do it the old fashioned way like Arya did. Bran even compares Leaf to Arya. A cloud of ravens was pouring from the cave and he saw a little girl with a torch in hand darting this way and that. For a moment, Bran thought it was his sister, Arya. Madly, for he knew his little sister was a thousand leagues away or dead. And yet there she was, whirling, a scrawny thing, ragged, wild hair, hair a tangled, tears filled Hodor's eyes and froze there. So we get a comparison to Arya. But also, let me read you Leaf's description and let me read you Nettle's description. Leaf and her people were far from childlike. Little wise men of the forest would have been closer. They were small compared to men, as a wolf is smaller than a dire wolf. That does not mean it is a pup. They had nut brown skin, dappled like a deer's with paler spots and larger ears that could hear things that no man could hear. Their eyes were big too, great golden cat's eyes that could see down passages where boys' eyes saw only blackness. Their hands had only three fingers and a thumb with a sharp black claws instead of nails. So you're probably like, okay, that doesn't sound human. Okay, well, let me give you Nettle's description. Nettles is almost always called the small brown girl. Small brown girl, small brown girl, small brown girl. In the end, the brown dragon was brought to heel by the cunning and persistence of a small brown girl of six and ten who delivered him a freshly slaughtered sheep every morning until Sheep Stealer learned to accept and expect her. Munkin sets down the name of this unlikely dragon rider as Nettles. Mushroom tells us the girl was a bastard of uncertain birth called Nettie, born to a dockside whore. By any name, she was black-haired, brown-eyed, brown-skinned, skinny, foul-mouthed, fearless, and the first and last rider of the dragon, Sheep Stealer. So they're both brown-skinned, curly-haired, but Leaf has cat eyes and fairy ears and long fingernails and shit. So how would that work? How would she get away with that? Easy. A glamour, like how Melisandre gets away with being a thousand years old. She's ancient, and I'm not saying this because show Melisandre, they showed us, you know, like that she was ancient. In A Dance with Dragons, she literally says that she studied her magic or her craft for years beyond count. But we've also seen glamours in the story, like the Lord of Bones or like Arya, how she changes faces, which is almost for sure a form of skin changing and likely linked to the old gods. I need to do a whole video on that, actually. I am. That'll probably be one of my videos coming soon. But that's not all the evidence. The name itself, Nettles, is a nature-based name. Let me give you the definition of Nettles. Now, and now y'all know I'm gonna fuck this up because these are some big words. Urticia diosia, diosia, Urticia dioica, often known as common nettle, stinging nettle, or nettle leaf, or just a nettle or stinger. Like, literally a nettle leaf? Come on, y'all. Like, I think it might be something because George has said, like, he can't even write for a character until he figures out what their name's gonna be and he puts a lot of thought into their names. Now, Nettles tamed a dragon, she tamed Sheep Stealer, and yes, Nettles could very well be just a Targ bastard. But what if she isn't? Because yes, yeah, she tamed a dragon, but Sheep Stealer is not even the dragon I'm impressed that she tamed. The dragon I'm impressed that she tamed was Daemon Targaryen. Essentially, Daemon Targaryen has lived his whole life scorned, basically by his family, like feeling like, you know what, my brother don't fuck with me, fuck the Greens, fuck Sir Otto, and his mission has been to sit his ass on that Iron Throne one way or the another, one way or another, which is how he gets married to his niece. But something 
changed him. Some Rhaegar level type of change. Something told an otherwise selfish motherfucker. Even though I like Damon, Damon is selfish. Something changed him. And he sacrificed himself to end this war. Or did he? Did he really? Or did he find some power that was even more enticing to him than the Iron Throne? Because he had all but won it. He had all but won the Iron Throne. Damon is the fucking rogue prince. He is a Targaryen prince, brother to the king. How did this girl, born to a dockside whore of no name, get so close to him? That she became his constant companion. That his dragon flipped the fuck out when she left. Rhaenyra will tell you it was sorcery. She is a common thing with the stink of sorcery upon her, the queen declared. My prince would ne'er lay with such a low creature. You need only look at her to know she has no drop of dragon's blood in her. It was with spells that she bound a dragon to her, and she has done the same with my lord husband. Honey, I don't think it was sorcery. Even though the children of the forest are magical beings that use magic, I think she told him what she was and she showed him things. The relationship that Nettles has with Damon seems to be very loving. He seems to be teaching her things and buying her lavish gifts. The maesters refer to it in the text as almost like a father-daughter relationship. The prince and his bastard girl supped together every night, broke their fast together every morning, slept in adjoining bedchambers, that the prince doted upon the brown girl as a man might dote upon his daughter, instructing her in common courtesies and how to dress and sit and brush her hair. He made gifts to her of an ivory-handled hairbrush, a silvered looking glass, a cloak of rich brown velvet bordered in satin a pair of riding boots of leather soft as butter. The prince taught the girl to wash, Norrin says, and the maid servants who fetched their bath water said he off shared a tub with her, soaping her back or washing the dragon stink from her hair, both of them as naked as their name days. I'm sorry, I feel like this is a student teacher teacher student relationship they fell in love i feel like leaf is teaching damon things about her world and damon is teaching leaf things about about the human world now for some reason nettles and damon split up at maiden pool and nettles flies northeast and for some reason damon goes to heron hall but before he goes to heron hall he tells lord mooton this is the last time you'll see me and he also tells him to let it be known that he rides for Harrenhal. So did he, Damon already know what might happen at Harrenhal? Did Nettle see it before she left? Did he plan for it? It's hard for me to believe that Damon would have willingly sacrificed Caraxes. But imagine the blood that the weirwood trees on the Isle of Faces could have soaked up that day. Two Targaryen princes and two dragons. So we know that Aemond appeared on the 14th day and he was not alone. He was with Alice, the witch queen of Harrenhal. Alice was pregnant by Aemond. Aemond helped her down off of Vagar and some words were exchanged. Damon asked how he found out where he was. Like, how you know where I was here? And Aemond says, my lady. She saw you in a storm cloud in a mountain pool at dusk, in the fire we lit to cook our suppers. She sees much and more. Does that not make you think about, like, Melisandre? Not only do we have, like, possible children of the forest, we have the fire witches like Melisandre seeing shit in the flames. I'm so excited for House of the Dragon, but I digress. So we know that the battle has no survivors. Aemon dies, Vagar dies, Caraxes manages to crawl to shore and dies all of the bodies are discovered, but Damon's is never found. And that just doesn't sit right with me. So what could have really happened to Damon? If Caraxes made it to shore, it's likely that Damon made it to shore too, just not the same shore. Caraxes made it to shore towards Harrenhal. Damon made it to shore on the Isle of Faces. And the children or the green men or whoever the fuck could have helped him, helped him. But hear me out. If there are caves and secret tunnels, Damon could have ended up in the one place he always ran from, the Vale. Where was Nettles last seen? In the Vale. Where in the Vale? In a cave with her dragon. 
A cave mouth was visible from the road, and a dozen men climbed up to see if it might offer them shelter from the wind. The bones scattered about the mouth of the cave might have given them pause, yet they pressed on and roused a dragon. Sixteen men perished in the fight that followed, and three score more suffered burns before the angry brown worm took wing and fled deeper into the mountains, with a ragged woman clinging to its back. That was the last known sighting of Sheep Stealer and his rider, Nettles, recorded in the annals of Westeros, though the wildlings of the mountains still tell tales of a fire witch who once dwelled in a hidden vale far from the road or village, one of the most savage of the mountain clan come to worship her. The storytellers say youths would prove their courage by bringing gifts to her, and they were only accounted men when they returned with burns to show that they had faced the dragon woman in her lair. Honey, we have bones all in the cave. Mm, Lord, what if, what if, if Nettles was indeed a child of the forest, Nettles could have used the cave system to get Damon or to get Damon and heal him. Or maybe they lived in that cave together until he died and she had to return home. She said she returned home because her heart was weary. Maybe Damon was essentially a green seer prodigy. Like I asked you, have you ever thought who predated Blood Raven? So maybe he's a green seer like Bran and Blood Raven before him. And before you write this off, check this out. Here are some commonalities between Damon and Blood Raven. The obvious one is that they both use Dark Sister, the Valyrian Steel Sword. They both were wielders of Dark Sister. But if you look at the lineages of House Targaryen, Damon is actually the great grandfather of Blood Raven. Damon's son, Viserys II, is the father of Aegon IV, Aegon the Unworthy. That Aegon the Unworthy is Blood Raven's dad. Another thing they have in common is they both fit that hero and villain archetype. They both fit that, oh, he was a hero to some, but he was the darkest villain of all to some. And we see that with both Blood Raven and with Damon. They both disappeared and are presumed dead. So Blood Raven was sent to the Night's Watch by Egg for killing his nephew, and then he rose to Lord Commander and he disappeared. And Damon is presumed dead after killing his nephew, and he's presumed dead even though his body was never found. Blood Raven was also known for being with a Lysini witch, his sister, Shira Seastar. Well, she's half Lysini. Um, Shira Seastar's mother was from Lys, and her father was Aegon IV. But Damon is also known for being with a Lysini witch, Masaria the White Worm. So could Damon have been a green seer? Or could he have been a mistake that they thought was going to be a green seer before Blood Raven? Before they found Blood Raven, could they have thought, oh, it's this guy? It, it's Damon Targaryen. Or could Damon have really been a green seer and Blood Raven is just his replacement? Something is definitely going on here. Like something is definitely up with all this. I spent way too much time on this. This video is getting way too long. So I got to cut back. I got to cut back. I'm going to cut back. But all of this leaves me with one question. If all of this is true, if this theory is true, where the fuck is Sheep Stealer? As always, thanks for watching. Thanks to everyone that supports me on Patreon. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. Please click that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, and join the Sweet Summer family. Okay, my Sweet Summer children, have a good day.